anyone doesn't want to be seen in the recording, um, yeah, you can un you can hide your video and you can change your name. Uh, it will only really record whoever's speaking anyway, and the presentation uh, uh, slideshow that we have. So I think that's it in terms of all of the, the technical things. So I'm going to hand over to our um, host, Abigail Wood. Over, over to you, Abby. Thanks very much, Marvin. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining this event today on this really, really important issue. Um, my name's Abby Wood, and I'm Chief Executive of AGK London. I've seen a question in the chat about timings for today. So just so everyone knows, we're going to have this session running until 22, then a five minute break, then 45 minutes in the breakout sessions, then we'll come back for the closing session. Um, I think it's really fair to say that many organisations working with older people have identified food insecurity as a long term issue that's been both exposed and exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, certainly AGKs in London who provide vital support throughout lockdown and beyond have consistently been reporting that access to food is one of the biggest challenges facing the older people that they support. Um, they've also reported problems in accessing food as a result of patchy provision, barriers caused by poverty, by learning difficulties and cognitive impairments, and also barriers caused by digital exclusion for those who need food deliveries. In this first session, we're going to be hearing from two speakers who are going to be talking to us about two really valuable pieces of research um, and what makes both the research that was carried out by the GLA into food insecurity and by Sustain into Meals and Worlds provision so valuable is that both of them began before the pandemic really hit, but then they continued the research throughout that time. So they're able to report on the impact that that time had on older Londoners' access to food. Um, first, we're going to hear from Helen Moore, who's going to be talking to us about the GLA's research, and then Morvan is going to be talking to us about Sustain's research, and then there'll be some time for some questions before we finish this session. So, Helen, over to you. Hello. Um, I think, Morvan, do you have my slides, or should I just present from my computer? What works best for you? I do, yes, I'll just get them up. One oh, second. <laughs> Absolutely fine. Um, it always takes a few seconds for me to just <laughs> change things over to share screen. No problem. So, That's fine. Right. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so um, thank you so much for attending everyone. So yeah, my name's Helen and um, I'm a researcher at the GLA and I'm going to talk you through the qualitative research that the GLA has undertaken recently um, with our food policy team, um, exploring in experiences of food insecurity amongst older Londoners, uh, both before and during COVID-19. Okay, so um, next slide, please. So. Perfect, thank you. Um, so just a little very quick bit of background as to why we chose to do this research. As we've heard from Abby, um, anecdotally, there has been a lot raised recently about food insecurity um, amongst older people. Um, but what we find is that the formal research often focuses on economic hardship as the main cause of food insecurity. Um, but actually, especially when you look at the older group um, this older group of people, there are other factors that we, we need to be exploring. So um, an inability to physically get to the shops or access food, an inability to prepare food due to um, sort of a lack of manual dexterity or health conditions. Um, secondly, we chose to do the research because um, a lot of the, the previous research out there focuses on um, the reasons for food insecurity and policy measures. Um, but doesn't really explore the lived experiences of this of this group. So certainly there's a, a lack of qualitative research um, looking at food insecurity amongst older people. And thirdly, um, it was a very timely issue. So we'd actually planned to do this research prior to COVID-19 and then the pandemic hit and we thought this would be very interesting uh, to look at because 
shielding will have created a situation where um, a lot of Londoners who weren't previously food insecure are now unable to leave the house and they've really had their access to food curtailed. Okay, next slide. So very briefly, um, the research objectives. So what we hope to find out with this research were the causes of food insecurity um, amongst older Londoners, the experiences, so how do, you, how do people experience food insecurity and what impact does that have on general well-being? And um, sort of separately to, to COVID, uh, the extent to which the diet and water intake of older Londoners are monitored and discussed and the extent to which older Londoners understand their nutritional needs and they're concerned by their, um, their nutritional intake. And uh, next slide. Um, so we did this um, through phone interviews. So we spoke to 16 participants in total. All of these were recruited via a field work agency. Um, there were 45 minute interviews. Um, that's actually a typo. They were conducted um, from Monday the 22nd of July to uh, Wednesday 29th, so last period of July, and um, just as we were leaving lockdown. And we spoke to a range of Londoners, so all of them had to shield, uh, but whether this was due to age or health conditions um, it was mixed. A range of ages, a range of food insecurity, so around half um, were food insecure prior to COVID-19 and half uh, were food insecure as a result of COVID-19. Um, and in addition to this, there was a mixture by disability status, so households, so who they live with, um, if they receive government parcels or not, dietary restrictions, location, ethnicity and gender. Okay, next slide. So I'll just talk you through um, what we found out about food insecurity during COVID-19, first of all. So, next slide. Um, Perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, we found that COVID-19 has had um, an adverse impact on older Londoners' access to food. So whilst none of the Londoners that we spoke to went without food during lockdown, uh, several were, were extremely worried that they might, as it was so difficult to access food during this time. Um, the majority that we spoke to had shopped online before, so at least were familiar with the process. Um, but as we've seen from Jackie's video, uh, accessing a priority slot was extremely difficult and it could take several weeks to do that. Um, instead, people were piggybacking on orders placed by uh, their friends or family. Um, they were perhaps getting friends or family to shop for them in person and deliver the shopping. Um, but that has issues in itself because um, People don't always think of uh, the practicalities when they're shopping for someone else. So, for instance, we had one respondent who was diabetic, and uh, whilst he was very grateful for his daughter doing the shopping for him, um, she actually bought the high sugar items when he would have bought low sugar items. Um, we had another respondent uh, who uh, lives on her own, and she said that people would, would buy her things, but they wouldn't think about the sell-by dates. And actually, if you're living on your own, takes you a while to get through food. So it's really important to have that long sell by date. Um, we also saw from Jackie about the, the expense of shopping online. Products might not be in stock and actually a lot of cultural foods are, are not available online. So people perhaps couldn't get the kosher meat or they would have to ask friends and family to drop this off for them separately. Um, we found that whilst people were grateful for government food parcels, the food wasn't actually adequate often to create a kind of a balanced meal and especially um, we found with those that were diabetic the food could be quite starchy and a lot of white bread a lot of sugary items um, and we also found that uh, one person who was arthritic mentioned it was very difficult for him to open the tinned goods in the food parcels so all of these issues um, meant that for, for many older people during lockdown, there were changes in their diets. And in some cases, they were actually limiting their food consumption um, because they weren't sure when they were going to be able to access more food. OK, next slide, please. So just a couple of quotes here that illustrate how people's priorities shifted during lockdown from managing the diet to sort of eating whatever food um, was accessible to them. So we've got our first quote from John, who's a diabetic, um, where lockdown was just sort of this period of panic. And it was like, 
um, I, you know, I couldn't get onto the, the priority list straight away. So I was just eating frozen fruit and veg and I was eating whatever bread I could find, even though it were white bread. Um, and I'm a diabetic and I know that I shouldn't be really eating that. Um, I just I just need to eat rather than manage my diet at the moment. Similarly, we've got a quote from Ruth on the right. Um, who's saying because she's now doing online shopping, she's having to make do with whatever's available rather than buying, um, rather than actually choosing what food she wants to eat. Okay, so next slide. Additionally, um, there was an evident social impact to lockdown, which shouldn't be overlooked. There was a lot of anxiety um, before lockdown officially happened. A lot of the people we spoke to were shielding themselves and um, it started to prepare for COVID. So they were, weren't were going out, um, but they were having to do this without government support. So they were having to do this without the priority online slots, without the government boxes, which is very difficult. And there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding this period. And um, secondly, we found that shopping is actually a very important assurance of autonomy for, for everyone really, not just older people. Um, and Many were using their weekly shop or their daily shop to, to as a chance to get out and about and provide some structure to the day. And this was then taken away from them. Um, it's actually a very important exercise of autonomy, being able to, to choose your own food. And um, we shouldn't forget that. And thirdly, neighbours, whilst we we're grateful uh, for, for help, they often restricted their offers to practical help. And actually, it's very important that we, we stop and chat to people as well, especially for those who are living on their own. This time could be very lonely. OK, thank you. Next slide. So this is just uh, the findings that we, we found from looking at food insecurity more generally amongst older people. So next slide. So um, we found that the majority of respondents tend not to meaningfully discuss their diet with healthcare professionals um, and there aren't really asked about what they're eating when they're attending appointments for other health issues. So the one exception is diabetics, um, because they tend to have diabetic clinics where they would be discussing their diet with, with healthcare professionals. And, um, and there was actually uh, another man that we spoke to who'd had um, a heart bypass. So for those that have had health issues that are linked to diet in the past, we found that some of those were actually healthier now than they were when they were younger. But for the majority, um, they wouldn't really be discussing their diet um, with anyone. They might discuss with their family. Uh, family might say, oh, do you feel that you're eating enough? But that's when it would sort of end. It wouldn't be a discussion around what are you eating and when are you eating it. Um, and it's very rare that the older people that we spoke to would be discussing their water consumption with anyone. Um, we also found that there was quite little consideration about why diet might have to change with age. So some of the people we spoke to questioned why their diet would need to change so long as they were continuing to eat healthily. Um, but then we, we think of healthy as being low sugar, low fat, lots of fruit and veg, which actually isn't necessarily the kind of thing that you should be thinking about when, as you're growing older. Um, factors such as bone density and the impact of diet on certain health conditions such as arthritis weren't really very widely mentioned. Okay, next slide. Um, one of the main predictors of difference in diet that we found was household size. So there were quite distinct differences in diets between those who live alone um, versus those who live with others. Um, it could be it could be due to other factors such as age, um, but yeah, there was it was definitely a difference between household size. So reasons such as um, I can't be bothered to cook for one. Um, I'm living on my own, so there's no reason for me to stick to meal times. Um, and cooking for one uh, requires multiple ingredients, which can lead to food waste. All these things. Uh, sort of contributed to those who live on their own perhaps having a less a less healthy a less consistent diet than those um, who were living with someone else and who could share the experience of a meal time um, we found as well that that mental health conditions such as loneliness may impact appetite so um, I spoke to one respondent who since losing her husband 
that says, um, she says, I just eat junk and snacks rather than cooking meals. And obviously such mental health conditions aren't limited to those living alone, but it can be difficult to spot symptoms when we're not living with someone else. Okay, next slide. And we found that coping mechanisms are evident amongst those who are food insecure. So those who sometimes struggle to shop for or prepare um, or eat food prior to COVID-19 due to um, health conditions, perhaps. We found that they're employing mechanisms to, to get around that. So um, I spoke to one lady who was choosing soft foods because they're, they're easier to chew, but that does limit your vari the variation that you have in your diet. Um, I spoke to a man who's arthritic, so when his arthritis isn't flaring up, he will batch cook. Um, and a couple of people who have COPD, a respiratory condition, so when they're unable to leave the house, they will stockpile food. Um, th sorry, they'll stockpile food for when they're unable to leave the house. And there is a potential danger, therefore, that uh, people come to rely increasingly on these coping mechanisms and they, they fail to realise that they're becoming more and more limited in what they can do and what they can eat until it, it could be too late. Um, the potential risk here is compounded by the fact that, that many older people fail to discuss their diet, certainly in any great detail with others, and there's a, a real lack of uh, awareness of the support available, most, uh, both generally and amongst those who are, who are slightly more vulnerable. So next slide, and um, this is just about the, the lessons that we can take forward from our research. So things that we found that are sort of good to think about in terms of how we can improve the situation. So firstly, even as lockdown lifts, many are still anxious. Um, our research was conducted in July 2020 when lockdown was being lifted. Um, but this anxiety may be even more prevalent now as we teeter around the brink of the second lockdown and no one's really sure what's happening. I had a couple of people, a couple of respondents say that they would appreciate a vulnerable hour in supermarkets, which would mean that they didn't have to online shop and they could go and choose their own fruit and veg. Um, but they were doing so in a sort of shielded space where everyone was very respectful of social distance, social distancing. Um, the vast majority we spoke to are not really planning on going back into shops soon, even though they prefer it to online shopping, so they just don't feel safe. But it is important that we keep face-to-face -face shopping as an option, as, as we've seen, it's very valuable in enabling independence and autonomy. Um, we, thinking widely, um, it's, it's also, so thinking outside of the group of older people, it's also important that those who interact with them are, are aware of the support available and um, that we ask older people more about their diet. So um, encouraging this discussion of diet with friends and family, including water consumption. And also for those of us who perhaps offer support to older people, understanding that that support is not always practical, but it's, it's very often emotional, especially now when it's such an uncertain time. And also all of us being more aware of the support that is available to, to older people, uh, both during COVID and, and more generally. So we're able to advise on that. And yeah, thank you. So that's, that's the end. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Helen. I think what was especially powerful about that was seeing in older people's own words exactly what, what they'd been experiencing and how things have been for them. So now I'm going to pass over to Morven, um, who's going to present her latest piece of research. Brilliant, thanks very much. Um, I'm just getting the sharing screen up again. And <clears throat> there we go, that should be working. Thanks for that introduction. Yeah, so my name's Morvan Oliver Larkin and I um, work at the charity Sustain um, on our London Food Poverty Campaign and Older People's Food Campaign. Um, <clears throat> so my research was a small qualitative project looking at Meals on Wheels services in London. Um, like Helen's research, I actually started prior to COVID-19 and then when COVID-19 happened, um, uh, I was in the midst of my research and kind of changed some aspects of it as I, as I um, got on to. Um, you can download that research paper on our website and we'll also send it round after the event. Um, in the, this presentation, I'm going to give an overview of how I did the research and some key findings from it and the recommendations that I made as a result of those, those key findings. Um, <clears throat> 
So the research itself um, involved predominantly interviews and ride-along visits and site visits. So this was focusing more or less on Meals on Wheels services, although I did also speak um, with people involved in other types of uh, food services for older adults in London. Um, so I spoke with service users themselves, as well as older adults who, who didn't have services available in their local area. I also spoke with people commissioning services in local councils, people running these services in local councils, and people who were involved in actually um, running them on the ground, so delivery staff, um, service managers, and so on. Um, as I said, I also spoke to some people involved in related services, such as um, shopping services or lunch clubs. Lunch clubs, I think, are a really important kind of complementary service to Meals on Wheels because um, they, they provide a, a community-focused um, place where people can go to eat together, whereas Meals on Wheels is, is much more about um, being able to eat in, safely and healthily in your own home if you're not able to cook for yourself regularly. Um, <clears throat> So just before I get into kind of the findings from the research itself, some context to this research is that Meals on Wheels services across the country over the past 10 years have been cut back quite a lot along with other um, cuts under austerity policies. So in London, this is quite drastic. Fewer than 10 boroughs now provide a Meals on Wheels service out of 33 um, London Borough Councils. And so this kind of creates a postcode lottery in terms of what's available for people who need this service. Um, another um, piece of context behind this is that um, people over the age of 65 are at very high risk of malnutrition. It's, it's a demographic that's at, at the highest risk of mal malnutrition. So that's kind of the context in which this um, research was situated. <clears throat> um, that's just one of the delivery drivers for one of the services that I um, did some of the research with. So uh, as I said, I, I um, started my research with more established services before COVID-19 hit. Um, and some of the key findings from that research itself. Um, the first thing to say that was quite interesting is that there's lots of different reasons that someone might need this type of service. I don't think it's true to say that everyone over a certain age would need this service at all. Um, there's actually a breadth, a breadth of types of people who benefit from the service. Um, uh, by and large, those who do need the service are people who struggle to do food shopping or to cook at home. Um, this can be due to disability, health, um, age, mental health issues, um, or often it can also be a recovery from a time in hospital, recovery from a fall. And by and large, people who do need the service kind of fall into two categories, one of which is some form of recovery to enable people to get back on their feet when they're not doing so well. Um, and for other people, it's a permanent service that they're using and this enables them to stay in their own homes and not um, need res residential care settings for a lot longer. Um, so, um, yeah, after that, I also saw that in a lot of the places that I was going to, um, the services provided this more than just a meal approach. And this is a really, really important aspect of these types of services. They included welfare checks and they also um, linked up with adult social care services. So um, the delivery drivers were, were brilliant people and um, would be just checking in with people daily, providing that regular social contacts, contact. And then also if they sort of spotted that something was a bit off, they'd be checking in and then reporting that back to, to head office if something, someone seemed like their health was deteriorating in any way. So it can be a really um, beneficial thing, not just about the nutrition itself. And a lot of them also linked with a lot of kind of um, related services like active aging or nutrition screening. So provided that, that um, wraparound support. <clears throat> Interestingly, in terms of um, how people viewed this service in councils where this was um, being commissioned or run, uh, there was quite a large consensus that this is um, a really beneficial um, service that has a, a strong preventative uh, benefit but that a lot of people within councils were having to make really difficult decisions. So they, they understood that, you know, having a Meals on Wheels service can help people to stay healthier for longer. And um, this can reduce costs for the to, to the NHS in that, that it reduces um, the number of times that ambulances might have to be called out for falls, the number of GP visits, all of this kind of um, 
holistic preventative support but because of the way that um, budgets are often kind of segmented into different uh, different streams those cost savings to the NHS weren't seen by adult social care say and adult social care might be actually paying for this type of service so people often felt like it would be good to maintain this service but because there's no st statutory obligation to maintain it it's just too difficult in terms of the pressure that they're under under to um, cut budgets um, so that was interesting in terms of speaking to people in local authorities and and lastly as well as all of the benefits to people who are actually receiving the service um, the the jobs that they created seemed seemed really brilliant um, i had the pleasure of doing a few ride-alongs with delivery staff and it was clear that the workers i spoke to really loved the work that they were doing and um, many of them had worked in kind of lower paid retail jobs or cleaning jobs and they spoke about treated being treated not very well in those um, previous jobs whereas the work that they were doing here they felt like they were part of a team where um, everyone was working towards uh, something valuable that helped society and they felt um, that they really appreciated the work that they were doing so it created good meaningful jobs in lots of local areas <coughs> as i said before um covid19 happened in the middle of my um, research and uh so i start i carried on doing interviews and site visits well i stopped doing site visits but i carried on doing uh telephone interviews with people in existing services but i also then started doing um some interviews with people in these new services that were emerging in response to COVID-19. So this was mutual aid groups or um, existing voluntary and community sector groups that had been doing maybe lunch, um, community lunch clubs or cookery classes and then they changed to a hot meal delivery service due to COVID-19. From those um, conversations and interviews, some of the um, key findings that I saw were that there was some difficulty in getting the referral pathway correct. So there would be a lot of people who um, wanted to set up a service, they saw this need, but then they found it hard to reach the people who actually needed it best. And I could see that when this worked really well, it was either that that um, group was really well embedded into the local community and had links with people who might need the service, or they were linked up with adult social care uh, teams, hospital dick discharge teams or local age uk branches <clears throat> um, i also saw from some of the kind of more ad hoc diy community groups that sprang up that there was at first quite a reliance on volunteers and on um, surplus food and that seemed quite difficult for a lot of the people who were um, running these services to maintain in a sustainable way and um, with sur surplus food it can be quite um, hard to know what you're going to get week by week so they actually shifted then to um, buying food in so that they could um, they could have a consistent and healthy off offer throughout and also reliance on volunteers whilst of course it's it's volunteers can have a great role in these kind of services where it was wholly volunteer run and um, so coordinators chefs that kind of thing people who'd been on furlough were playing those integral roles that was really difficult to sustain as well um, although there were some setbacks with these informal models i also saw that for a lot of people it it felt for a lot of people receiving the meals it felt more like you're part of a community who's helping one another out rather than the recipient of a service so that could reduce some of the stigma that can be associated with some of these um, services uh, so just quickly then on to the recommendations that I made coming out of this so in the in the short term um, and kind of at the more localized level i think one thing that really can be helpful across the board if there was a streamlined streamlined and standardized referral pathway and um, where services are really supported to be able to be linked in with adult social care and hospital discharge teams and that this was kind of strand, standardized across across the board because there was a real difference in some services had were inundated with referrals and some were really struggling to get referrals and that wasn't really to do with demographics i think that was to do with the way that um referrals were ha happening i i also saw that um where services operated at a slightly larger um sort of economy of scale they were able to to work better so having services that exist across a few boroughs can be really good um and of course just the funding 
for any new provision that is springing up. A lot of the new services that I saw were not going to be able to um, continue in this in a way without funding as it was a little bit on a shoestring. So they were looking for more um, permanent funding. And in terms of longer term recommendations, I think something that's absolutely vital is some kind of a statutory requirement on local authorities so that people don't feel that their hands are tied and that they have to cut this service. I think that this should be quite broad, so it should be something whether it's um, a statutory requirement to ensure that all older people can access at least one good meal per day and that kind of leaves room for this to be done through Meals on Wheels services, through lunch clubs um, and other community efforts, but Meals on Wheels would play an absolutely vital role within that. Um, and of course, if you place a statutory requirement on local authorities, there needs to be adequate funding for that local authority. Um, and then I also think in terms of evaluation mechanisms, um, looking at budgets in a kind of longer term holistic sense and seeing that, oh, these cost savings to the NHS are actually coming from this funding that we're using here in adult social care, say, is, um, would, would make councils more able to justify funding these um, so yes thanks very much for listening that's me um, that's a little bit about our campaign and uh, if anyone wants to get in contact with me afterwards and has questions so yeah that's me back over to you Abby yeah thank you very much Melvin that was absolutely fascinating that research um, I've also seen there's loads of really great comments um, in the chat function we're supposed to be going for a break now, so I'm going to suggest that I just pick up on one question because this really stuck out to me as an interesting one. The question to I think both to you Morgan and to, to Helen of was pride an issue um, in terms of people asking for help or feeling that they, they couldn't ask for help? Is that something that either you or Helen picked up in, in carrying out this research? Mm -hmm. um, would, would you like to go first Morgan or shall I? Um, Sure, yes. I think it was, yeah. I think that that, that definitely was something that, that came into it. And like I said, with the, um, with the community run services where people felt that they were part of decisions being made and um, that this was part of a community of people who were helping one another out, I think that that could, that could help to really, really overcome that. Um, at, or to see this for people who did, I spoke to some people who really saw the Meals on Wheels service, for example, as a way for them to be able to do other things and have energy and strength to, to meet their grandkids and, um, and just to do these other things in life that really, really matter. And I think feeling that pride and, you know, um, I, des I deserve at any age of life, a good quality of life and um, connection with my family and if these services are here to enable that that can help to overcome it but I also think that there were people that I spoke to who who did feel um, they felt sad about um, needing to use this service and they felt um, that I think that proud pride did come into it and um, so yeah it's a complicated issue for sure. Yeah, thank you. Helen is that something that you saw in the research? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure if I saw pride being an issue but certainly I think um, people kind of normalize what they um, are and aren't able to do um, and if you're very slowly deteriorating that becomes quite problematic as you, you start well, we saw it in a slide about coping mechanisms you might start to use more and more coping mechanisms and you might not realize that actually some help would be really beneficial here and um, so that is sometimes I think if the help isn't being proactively offered and you're not exactly sure how it can, uh, what benefit it would bring to your life, it might not occur to you to try and seek it out. And also there's the, the issue that people don't really know where to go. Um, so I think perhaps that normalization, I think maybe an element of pride is, is incorporated into that as well. Um, but yeah. Thank you, that's, that's really interesting to, to hear that. We're running ever so slightly over time. We're supposed to have a quick break now. I just want to check with Simon, who is sorting out the, the tech side of things, if, whether we're all going to be automatically put into our appropriate breakout sessions at quarter two on the dot, um, or whether it's possible for everyone to, to take a five minute break and then move into those sessions. 
at, at 10 to. Yes, that's a very good idea. There are just a few people who I don't know which group they want to be in, so they will just stay in. When I activate the breakouts, they'll stay in plenary and I can just check with them which group they want to go in. But most people will. A, a pop-up box will come and you just have to click on that. Um, so uh, we can stay in plenary until I activate that if you want, Abby. Up to you. Just we do that so everyone can have a quick five minute break, um, get yourself a cup of tea, um, stretch your legs very quickly, and then we'll come back at 10 to, and as Simon says, the um, box will pop up on your screen to take you into the right breakout session. It's so just very quickly want to say a big thank you again to, um, to Morgan and Helen for some really fascinating research. I saw lots of comments in the chat that people really like to see these, these reports, so I think we'll be able to send them out to everyone so that they can, can see the detail. Brilliant, thank you very much everyone. Mm -hmm. So many of us, it's hard to <clears throat> get any verbal feedback from everyone. So we're going to go to, um, I'm just getting it up on my screen now. Um, if everyone could just go, and just a reminder if everyone could um, mute, uh, just so there's no background noise for everyone, if everyone could just go to menti.com, you can do this on the device that you're on or if you have another device as well, um, if you need to escape out of the Zoom window on the device that you're on, that's absolutely fine, you can do that and it should still just run in parallel. So you want to just go to www.menti, so M-E-N-T-I, dot com and then you'll be asked for a code um, and basically this is a way that we can all visually feedback from the sessions that we've just had so we can hear a little bit about what what other people were speaking about in the session that we didn't get to go to so you'll put in the code six one zero two five six five and it'll show up sorry my slides are being funny and um, it'll show up at, um, on the screen that I'm about to share as well um, so hopefully everyone's done that. If anyone joined a little bit late, it's basically going to menti.com and then putting in this code 610256. So I'm just going to go there and take us there now. Uh, bear with me while I sort the technology out. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, could you repeat the code? I've lost it. Oh, it's, uh, I'll get it up visually as well, but it's 61025655. I will get it up visually as well because that can be a little bit uh, confusing. One second. So, ah, yes, here we are. That's brilliant. So the code should be up at the top of the screen as well for anyone who hasn't, wasn't able to see it. Um, uh, so that should be there, 61025655. And the first question was just something quite simple about what were the key takeaways from your session? And it brings up everything that people are saying and the words that are bigger, quite a lot of people um, uh, are saying. So the more people that say them, the, more, the bigger the words get. So the ones that are sticking out clearly are funding, collaboration and sustainability and connection and nutrition. So that seems fitting considering everything that was going on in the morning and everything that we heard and um, funding is just staying there right in the beginning uh, right in the middle I love that broccoli has popped up too so that fits with nutrition I suppose having fresh fruit and veg is really really important the sustainability of services I think sustainability is probably coming up in relation to how do we make sure these services keep going um, uh, there's quite a lot going on as more people uh, Put things in partnerships working together is really important the importance of culturally appropriate food for people um, conversations social connection yeah that came up in the session that I was in as well I'm, I'm sad that I couldn't go into the other session that would have been brilliant so there's still a few more coming in so I'll just wait until our next slide quickly Sharing information, so that relates to the partnerships and working together, I think, and that was quite important from, from my research as well. Resilience came up as a big theme in, in our um, session. How can we promote the resilience of, of older people um, as individuals and within communities? 
um, better understanding. Yeah, there's some really great stuff and we'll share all of these slides at the end as well. So I'm just gonna move us on in terms of time to our next slide. Uh, if I can do that, I'm okay. There's quite a few things on my screen and that should take you all to the next slide as well. Uh, oh, there we go, perfect. So hopefully you will get a new screen now as well, um, where the question has come up, what do you think needs to happen? Um, I can't actually see it now, apologies. <laughs> what do you think needs to happen next to ensure good food for all older Londoners? So it would be great just to have people's feedback in terms of what you think needs to happen. And that should uh, give you an opportunity to feed into that. So we'll just start seeing people's responses as they come up. Link adult social care with NHS budgets. Better communication across services. So a lot of working together and joint work is definitely coming out of this. Um, and then policy change at city or national level. Um, There's a lot of stuff around integration between um, different partners working in this field, how we integrate budgets, how we integrate different people and the ways that they're working together. Um, and then there's stuff that's not about the government as well, but also around how um, people can learn to be more in touch with their own health, self-screening, getting family and, friendly on fams, family and friends on board with this as well. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things around um, clear referral routes, making sure that Meals on Wheels are a statutory obligation. I would definitely agree with that one. <laughs> um, that's an interesting one. Duplication of food support efforts and distribution methods meant that there were gaps or inefficiencies. So um, in some places, I suppose there isn't a, a service at all. And then in other places, maybe there's duplication. And I suppose that relates to the communication and partnership working that we were talking about before and how important it is for people to, um, for people who might need services to know about them, but then for people delivering services to actually be communicating with each other as well. And um, from a lot of the research that I've done, I think there's a clear kind of, even if everything isn't directly provided by the council, there is a clear role to kind of oversee and um, be a conduit for information for uh, the council can really help helpfully play that role. Um, better understanding of the diverse needs of older people. Yeah, that was something that came out in our session as well um, around how you kind of need an ecosystem of different types of support because um, not everyone needs the same thing at all. A Meals on Wheels service isn't what everyone needs. There needs to be lots of different things available and there needs to be some understanding of, of, of what lockdown has actually been like for a lot of older people and, um, and, and what their needs might be. Uh, it's brilliant to see so many answers coming in. Thank you so much for everything that you've, uh, that you've added. We can, I think we can share these at the end. We can definitely share the word cloud. I think we can share this, but we are gonna do a write up and share the initial recording um, as well as a, a write up of what came out of the session. So there will be um, something that you can share more widely afterwards. Um, <clears throat> just while my screen is still sharing, um, the, the kind of, uh, in our sessions and in some of the research that's come out and in some of these um, bits of feedback, there's, there's been a real emphasis on collaboration, on people working together and on sharing best practice. So um, sustain, I hope you can all see this, but um, that's our, just one of our web pages uh, around our older people's food campaign and the work that we do around Meals on Wheels and other aspects of, of improving food for, more, for older people. What we also have, so you can go to this webpage and I'll put it in the chat afterwards, um, but we also have a, an email forum. So that's for anyone who's actually involved in um, service, any kind of food service for older people so that you can share best practice. It's just a way to um, 
it's just a way to ask questions, share what you're doing, share research. It can be quite practical sometimes. It can be about policy. Um, so uh, it's just recently gotten off the ground. And if anyone is involved in that kind of work or is just interested in that kind of work, please do go to our website and uh, sign up and we can um, hear about the work that you're doing and you can ask questions and all of that kind of thing. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now uh, and hand back over to Abby for the last little section. Thanks very much. I think my only job really at the end is to say thank you. So say thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their fascinating research, for sharing the insights from the work that they've been undertaking and for sharing their personal experiences. I think all of those have really, we've all learned something, we've all heard some new things. I think we've all got quite a lot of food for thought to take away from today. Um, I'd also like to thank the organisers um, and particularly Simon for keeping all of the, the tech going. Um, I'm trying to look down the screen. I'm looking at Morgan to say I think we'll be sending round all of the presentations and reports to, um, to everyone who's attended so you'll be able to read them in a lot more detail. And then my final thank you is to all of you for coming, for participating, for contributing to such rich discussions in both the breakout sessions and through the chat and for making this a really interesting and worthwhile event. So thank you all very much. Hi, Morgan, can I ask a question before you leave? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, sorry about that. Now, I couldn't join that because yesterday I tried to help out an agent